Last month I visited Japan again for an opening ceremony of a new hospital at Hokkaido. It was Chinese New Year and there were many visitors around. And there is a saying going, the more visitors, the more accidents. That night, right after the party, two patrons were sent to our hospital. Car accident. It was due to the roads being slippery. The car lost control and spun 40 meters across the road and smashed into a tour bus. Luckily, there were no tourists inside or around the bus at the time, but the bus driver had his lower body crushed where the car had smashed. The driver of the car was an old man heading to a wedding ceremony. Information from the police said that he stepped on the brake too suddenly that the rear tire slipped. Very unfortunately, the car driver died immediately. That night, the family of the car driver came over and we had to tell them the tragic news. Meanwhile, the bus driver was rushed to do an immediate operation. We needed to observe him and decide whether or not to do another operation some days later when he awoke. We found that the bus driver's family had not arrived and we realized that he was living alone and had no family. The bus driver didn't wake for almost a week. His company's co-workers and managers did visit, but none of them stayed for too long since he was not in good shape. The doctor decided to do another operation since time was limited and they couldn't wait for him to decide. We had to think the best for any patrons. The operation did not go well from the doctor's information. The patient was bleeding badly during the operation and the health condition of him was not so good. The man died that evening, making it the second death in a hospital. That night, when I went to tidy up the patient's room for the next day's use, I saw a person facing the wall, mumbling to the wall. I tried to go and ask him who he was, but I was stopped by a nurse whom had worked at the hospital for years. She pulled me over and told me never to speak to such people. I suddenly realized that the person I saw looked just like the injured bus driver. I may have just experienced the hospital's first ever ghost story. I had an episode of sleep paralysis last February 8th. I discussed it with my mother when we were having lunch the day after. I asked her if she had experienced sleep paralysis because she's not the type of person who tells you everything unless you ask her to. So I asked her, and she asked back, what is sleep paralysis? I chuckled a little. I told her what it was, and I told her I felt something inside me was coming out every time I experienced sleep paralysis. She suddenly remembered her paranormal experience that happened a year before I was born. This has nothing to do with sleep paralysis per se, but she just remembered her experience out of the blue and I wanted to share. My mom is the youngest of seven siblings, and they weren't born into a rich family. Only my aunt, the seventh child, let's call her Aunt Lauren, was the only one who finished college in the family. Aunt Lauren was working in Japan when their father died sometime in 1992. My mom followed Aunt Lauren to Japan a few months after his death to work as a singer. They lived together, and this is where it began. Mother comes home before dawn from work, and Aunt would leave for work in the morning, so Mom was always alone all day. She felt being watched every time she was left alone in the apartment that they had rented. She doesn't feel threatened, though she's naturally a scaredy cat similar to myself. She asked Aunt if she feels anything unusual when she's alone in the apartment. She answered no, and thankfully, Aunt didn't ask further. She'd often dream of her father sleeping beside her like he was sleeping as well. Sometimes, she would dream seeing his feet laying beside her head, and her father's head was beside her feet. Sometimes, she dreamt that Grandpa was standing at the foot or at the side of her bed staring at her. And lastly, and most terrifying, she dreamt of her father laying across her body with the very same bed she's sleeping in. She would always feel scared every time she woke up, because as I've said, she's a scaredy cat that even her dad is no exception. 
even though she knows it was only a dream, it felt incredibly real. At this point, I asked her why Grandpa would visit her often in her dreams after she left her country. She knew the reason why. Grandma asked her not to tell Aunt that she had died, because they knew she'd come home and it would cost so much money to return and then return back to Japan. She endured Grandpa's visits for a year, and it came to a point that she couldn't take it anymore. So she had told Aunt the truth. They both cried, and they mourned together, lit a candle, prayed for a soul, and bid their final goodbye. A few days after she told Aunt the truth, it was afternoon. Mom was tired of cleaning the apartment, and she instantly fell asleep on the couch right after she lied down. She dreamt of Grandpa kissing her forehead while she slept on the couch and left a letter and then left. She has never seen him in her dreams again. Last week my friend's greyhound Gigi had passed away. He was 19 years old and had come to Japan with my friend 10 years ago from the UK. My friend and Gigi had grown up together and they are very close to each other. Gigi was huge and was a great fan of tracking. We had a paintball team and our practice field was inside a forest. Gigi would be jumping around the woods while we headed to our field and it would wait for us in our tent until we finished our practice so we could play with it. We ended up moving back to Japan in order to pursue our passion for competitive paintball and Gigi had come with us. Gigi had started to develop ailments and the dog's ability to keep up with us was decreasing. My friend slowly backed away from Paintball as to spend more time with Gigi, realizing the dog's time was coming. Gigi's spirit was never lost and its positivity in the face of pain was incredible, and it still desired to join us in our expeditions. After multiple visits to the vet, sadly my friend had no other option to spare Gigi its suffering and put the dog down. My friend was heartbroken. We had a funeral for Gigi. My friend was depressed since his best partner had gone away forever. That night, a few more friends and I stayed to console him. We reflected upon the positive times and how he had somewhat been our unsaid mascot for our paintball team. We cheered up and drank a little, until suddenly we heard something scratching at the front door. Our friend, now quite drunk, went up to the door and shouted, Be well, Gigi, and I'll see you again one day. We all went quiet. Then we all heard a very faint whining, something like a sound that a dog makes, and then silence. My friend returned and told us that Gigi had come to say his last goodbyes. In its honor, we changed our team emblem to the breed that Gigi was. One hot summer day, me and four of my friends were traveling around the countryside of old Tokyo. I rode my motorcycle and my friends drove a van. I stopped at a gas station to fill up my motorcycle. My friends stopped as well and bought some soft drinks to have in their van. We went to the shrines and looked around the area. It was late and the surroundings were already darkening. We found an old motel and decided to stay there for a night. The old owner of the motel came out and greeted us. We decided to stay for a night in a suite to save our money. There were two king-size beds in the room, more than enough for five persons to stay in. We heard from the owner that some of the rooms were abandoned because of dry rot and general breakdown. Why abandon them and not just refurnish, we asked, to which he replied, Unfortunately, I don't have enough money to refurnish. Due to lawsuits of events that had occurred in some of those rooms, I've become nearly bankrupt. We chatted for a while, discussing the area and its strange history, until we heard a shocking voice of a little girl screaming sharply in the distance. Did you guys hear that? I asked my friends. We all went quiet and heard a second scream. We went out and tried to find where the screaming was coming from. Give me the flashlight, said one of my friends. He took the light and led the way. 
We walked around the small corridor and found nothing. A while later, we heard another scream just right beside our room. We thought that there were some other people staying at the motel. The next morning, we asked the owner if there were little kids staying there. We knocked on the door, but there was no response. The owner looked shocked and answered us. I'm afraid, my friends. There was no other guest last night, and the room beside the suite had been abandoned for more than six years due to an ongoing investigation. The owner also told us that there were past patrons who arrived six years ago that day, a man and a little girl, whom he presumed to be the man's daughter. He had heard a scream and two gunshots that night, only to find both occupants lifeless with fatal gunshot wounds inflicted and self-afflicted by the father. Could that screaming have been the ghostly memory of the little girl? We may never know. I have reviewed this experience repeatedly in my mind since it happened about 14 years ago. I haven't told many people, not that it's anything to be embarrassed about, but I feel comfortable sharing it online anonymously. I know what I saw, and I know for sure I was not dreaming the experience. The only thing I wonder if it was a trick on my eyes. I also am slightly disturbed by the way I reacted to it. Not at all how I would expect one to react when seeing an apparition in the way I saw one. My family lived in Okinawa at the time, Kadena Air Force Base in case you were wondering. The houses we lived in were concrete bunkers that could withstand the typhoons that came fairly frequently over the island. The word bunker might make them sound like terrible homes, but they were actually pretty nice to live in. My bedroom was shared with my brother and we slept in bunk beds, me on the bottom and him on the top. I was always a light sleeper and had a history of being frightened in the night for no good reason and crawling in bed with my parents when I was younger. As I recall, I was over that phase in my childhood at this point. One night, at some ungodly hour, I was awakened to see a boy suspended in the small space between me and the bottom of the top bunk. The boy was completely motionless, like a still picture, with his eyes closed and arms outstretched. This is what I am disturbed most about in the story. I didn't make a noise. I didn't scream or even get out of bed. I was simply confused. I reached out, and to this day I wonder why I did this, tried to touch the boy to see if he were real. When my hand reached him, he vanished in the most peculiar way. I will attempt to describe the way in which the boy disappeared. There are images that can be found in books and online that are designed to trick the brain. If viewed in a particular way, the viewer will perceive a three-dimensional image. For many, it is difficult to achieve this. After seeing the projected image, when one tries to move a hand through it, the illusion is broken and the eyes focus past into the pattern of the page. The three-dimensional projection seems to blend back into the page. I'm not saying what I saw was an illusion of some sort, but this is exactly what happened when I tried to touch him. His image seemed to blend back into the top of the top bunk, and he was gone. Afterwards, I went right back to sleep. How I was able to sleep after that, I have no earthly idea. I didn't tell my parents, but I told my brother. He didn't take it seriously at all. He even joked that it was actually him and that he was doing push-ups over me at night. To clear some possible curiosity, I am not certain what race the boy was. He may have been Okinawan and some victim of the war. I think it is possible that he was an American boy who died at that same room in his sleep. It is also possible that he was a victim of a habu snake bite, which can be lethal. Habus are common in that area. Some years later in the United States, I had a similar experience. I may just share that later. Back in July 2010, I had a trip to Okinawa. 
located south of Japan with Tokyo's diocese teenage Catholics and a few fathers too. Just a note, Okinawa is one of the places in Japan which had suffered the consequences of World War II, being attacked by the US military. There were many casualties during this war, including Japanese civilians, military, and US military. Since I already studied about Okinawa's story, I had a strange feeling that something spiritual will happen there before I visited Okinawa. I've already had another experience, but I'll submit that later. And Okinawa is one of the places that have a US military base that we visited. I believe that was on the second day of the trip. We're guided by a local person to an underground made cave called GAMA, which was used to be a local people's place of refuge in case of aerial bombing runs. And because of the low hygiene, many people had died there, such as children, women, elderly, and even sick or injured people. The cave itself was incredibly dank and wet, quite slippery because of the rain, and also very dark. Or should I say, pure darkness, pure black. Because of that, we had to move with hand lights. While we were advancing, we had a moment to turn off the lights to see how incredibly dark it was. The cave was incredibly cold as well. A few seconds later, I heard a woman's crying voice in the cave, but I noticed that wasn't the voices of the girls with us, and there were only two girls with us on the trip. And then I started to think to myself, this is not a living person's voice. Later, we exited out of the cave, and in order to confirm, I asked to the girls which one of them had cried out, but they answered, none of us and I asked the boys too but received the same information I wondered what the crying woman's spirit wanted during World War II Japanese civilians had a saying that went alongside the military when the US soldiers comes to you suicide before they kill you all die for glory die for Japan when reflecting upon what the woman said when she screamed it was that exact mantra. Eight feet tall, Orhachisa Katsuma is a Japanese urban legend about a tall woman who abducts children. She's eight feet tall, wears a long white dress, and makes a sound like Po, 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 Po. My grandparents lived in Japan. Every summer my parents would take me there on holiday to visit them. They lived in a small village and they had a large backyard. I loved to play there during the summer. When we arrived, my grandparents also welcomed me with open arms. I was their only grandchild, so they spoiled me. The last time I saw them was the summer when I was 8 years old. As usual, my grandparents booked a flight to Japan and we drove from the airport to my grandparents' house. They were delighted to see me and had a lot of little presents to give me. My parents wanted to have some time by themselves, so after a few days they took a trip to another part of Japan, leaving me in the care of my grandmother and grandpa. One day, I was playing out in the backyard. My grandparents were inside the house. It was a hot summer's day and I lay down on the grass to rest. I stared up at the clouds and enjoyed the feeling of the soft rays of the sun and the gentle breeze. Just as I was about to get up, I heard a strange sound. Paul, 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 Paul. I didn't know what it was, and it was hard to figure out where it was coming from. It sounded almost like somebody was making the noise themselves, as if they were just saying, Po, 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 over and over again in a deep masculine voice. I was looking around, searching for the source of the noise when I suddenly noticed something on top of the tall hedges that enclosed the backyard. I saw a straw hat. It wasn't resting on the hedge, it was behind it. And that's where the sound was coming from. Po, po, po. And then, the hat began to move, 
as if someone was wearing it. The hat stopped at a small gap in the edge, and I could see a face peering through. It was a woman. But the edges were high, almost eight feet tall. I was surprised at how tall this woman was. I wondered if she was wearing stilts or some sort of huge high-heeled shoes. Then, a split second later, she walked off and the strange noise disappeared with her, fading into the distance. Bewildered, I got up and wandered back into the house. My grandparents were in the kitchen drinking tea. I sat down at the table and, after a while, I told my grandparents what I had seen. They weren't really paying attention to me until I mentioned the distinctive sound. Paul. Paul. As soon as I said that, both of them suddenly froze. Grandma's eyes grew wide and she covered her mouth with her hands. Grandpa's face became very serious and he grabbed me by the arm. This is very important, he said, in an intense voice. You must tell us exactly how tall was she. As tall as the garden hedge, I replied, beginning to get scared. My grandfather bombarded me with questions. Where was she standing? When did this happen? What did you do? Did she see you? I tried to answer all his questions as best I could. He suddenly rushed out to the hallway and made a phone call. I couldn't hear what he was saying. I looked over at my grandma and she was trembling. Grandpa came barging back into the room and spoke to my grandmother. I've got to go for a little while, he said. You stay here with the child. Don't take your eyes off him for a second. What's going on, Grandpa? I cried. He looked at me with a sad expression in his eyes and said, You've been liked by Hachisakotsama. With that, he hurried out, got into his truck and drove off. I turned to my grandmother and cautiously asked, Who's Hachisakotsama? Don't worry. She replied in a shaky voice. Grandpa will do something. There's no need for you to worry. As we sat nervously in the kitchen waiting for my grandfather to come back, she explained what was happening. She told me there was a dangerous thing that was haunting the area. They called it Hachisakutsama because of its height. In Japanese, Hachisakutsama means eight feet tall. It takes on the appearance of an extremely tall woman and it makes a sound like ho, oh, ho, oh, ho oh, in a deep male voice. It appears slightly differently depending on who sees it. Some say it looks like a haggard old woman in a kimono, and others say it is a girl in a white funeral shroud. One thing that never changes is its height and the sound it makes. A long time ago it was captured by monks and they managed to confine it in a ruined building on the outskirts of the village. They trapped it using four small religious statues called Jesus that they placed at the north, south, east and west of the ruins and it wasn't supposed to be able to move from there. Somehow it managed to escape. The last time it appeared was 15 years ago. My grandmother said that anyone who saw 8 feet tall was destined to die within a few days. It all sounded so crazy, I wasn't sure what to believe. When Grandpa came back, there was an old woman with him. She introduced herself as Kei-san and handed me a small crumpled piece of parchment saying, Here, take this and hold it. Then, she and Grandpa went upstairs to do something. I was left alone in the kitchen with my grandmother again. I needed to go to the toilet. Granny followed me to the bathroom and wouldn't let me shut the door. I was beginning to get really frightened by all of this. After a while, Grandpa and Kason took me upstairs and brought me into my bedroom. The windows were covered in newspaper and lots of ancient runes had been written on them. There were small bowls of salt in all four corners of the room and a small Buddha figure placed at the center of the room on top of a wooden box. There was also a bright blue bucket. What's the bucket for? I asked. That's for your pee and poo, Grandpa replied. Kason sat me down on the bed and said, Soon, the sun will be setting, so listen carefully. 
You must stay in this room until tomorrow morning. You must not come out under any circumstances until 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Your grandmother and your grandfather will not speak to you or call you until then. Remember, do not leave the room for any reason until then. I will let your parents know what is going on. She spoke in such a grave tone that all I could do was quietly nod my head. You have to follow Kason's instructions to the letter, Grandpa told me, and never let go of the parchment she gave you. And if anything happens, pray to Buddha and make sure you lock this door when you leave. They walked out into the hallway, and after saying goodbye to them, I closed the bedroom door and locked it. I turned on the TV and tried to watch, but I was so nervous, I felt sick to my stomach. Grandma had left me some snacks and rice balls for me, but I couldn't eat them. I felt like I was in prison, and I was very depressed and scared. I lay down on the bed and waited. Before I knew it, I was asleep. When I woke up, it was just after 1 a.m. All of a sudden, I realized that something was tapping on the window. Tap, 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 tap. I felt the blood draining from my face and my heart skipped a beat. I desperately tried to calm myself down, telling myself it was just the wind playing tricks or maybe the branches of a tree. I turned up the volume on the TV to drown out the tapping noise. Eventually it stopped altogether. That's when I heard Grandpa calling me. Are you okay in there? He asked. If you're scared, you don't have to stay in there all alone. I can come in and keep you company. I smiled and rushed over to open the door, but then I stopped in my tracks. I had goosebumps all over my body. It sounded like grandpa's voice, but somehow it was different. I couldn't tell what it was, but I just knew. What are you doing? Grandpa asked. You can open the door now. I glanced to my left and a chill went down my spine. The salt in the bowls was slowly turning black. I backed away from the door. My whole body was trembling with fear. I fell to my knees in front of the Buddha statue and clutched the piece of parchment tightly in my hand. I started desperately praying for help. Please save me from Hachisakutsama, I wailed. Then I heard the voice outside the door. Paul. Paul. Paul, Paul. The tapping on the window started up again. I was overcome by fear and I crouched there in front of the statue, half crying and half praying for the rest of the night. I felt like it would never end, but eventually it was morning. The salt in all four bowls was pitch black. I checked my watch. It was 7.30 a.m. I cautiously opened the door. Grandma and Kason were standing outside waiting for me. When she saw my face, Grandma burst into tears. I'm so glad you're still alive, she said. I went downstairs and was surprised to see my father and mother sitting in the kitchen. Grandpa came in and said, hurry up, we've got to get going. We went to the front door and there was a large black van waiting in the driveway. Several men from the village were standing around it, pointing at me and whispering, that's the boy. The van was a nine-seater and they put me in the middle, surrounded by eight men. Kason was in the driver's seat. The man on my left looked down at me and said, You've got yourself in quite a spot of trouble. I know you're probably worried. Just keep your head down and your eyes shut. We can't see it, but you can. Don't open your eyes until we've got you safely out of here. Grandpa drove in front and my dad's car was following behind. When everyone was ready, our little convoy started moving. We were going fairly slow, around 20 kilometers per hour or maybe less. After a while, Kason said, This is where it gets hard, and started muttering a prayer under her breath. That was when I heard the voice. Paul, 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 Paul. I clutched the parchment Kason had given me tightly in my hand. I kept my head down, but I peeked outside. I saw a white dress fluttering in the breeze. 
It was moving along with the van. It was Hachisakutsama. She was outside the window, but she was keeping pace with us. Then, suddenly she bent down and peered into the van. No, I gasped. The man beside me shouted, Close your eyes. I immediately shut my eyes as hard as I could and tightened my grip on the piece of parchment. Then the tapping began. Tap, 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 tap. And the voice became louder. Oh, 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 oh. There was tapping on the windows all around us. All of the men in the van were startled and on edge, muttering nervously to themselves. They couldn't see eight feet tall, and they couldn't hear her voice, but they could hear her tapping on the windows. Kaysan started praying louder and louder until she was almost shouting. The tension inside the van was unbearable. After a while, the tapping stopped and the voice disappeared. Kaysan looked back at us and said, I think we're safe now. All of the men around me breathed a sigh of relief. The van pulled over to the side of the road and the men got out. They transferred me into my dad's car. My mother held me close and tears were running down her cheeks. Grandpa and my father bowed to the men and they went on their way. Kaysan came to the window and asked me to show her the piece of parchment she had given me. When I opened my hand, I saw that it had gone completely black. I think you will be okay now, she said. But just be sure. Hold on to this for a while. She handed me a new piece of parchment. After that, we drove straight to the airport and Grandpa saw us safely on the plane. When we took off, my parents breathed a sigh of relief. My father told me he had heard about eight feet tall before. Years ago, his friend had been liked by her. The boy disappeared and was never seen again. My father said there were other people who had been liked by her and lived to tell about it. They all had to leave Japan and settle down in foreign countries. They were never able to go back to their homeland. She always chooses children as her victims. They say it's because children are dependent on their parents and family members. This makes them easier to deceive when she poses as their relatives. He said the men in the van were all blood relatives of mine, and that's why they had been sitting all around me, and why my father and grandpa had been driving in front and in back. It was all done to try and confuse Hachisakutsama. It took a while to contact everyone and get them all together, so that's why I had to be confined in that room all night. He told me that one of the little Jizo statues, the ones that were meant to keep her trapped, had been broken, and that's how she escaped. It gave me chills. I was glad when we finally got back home. All of this happened more than ten years ago. I haven't seen my grandparents since then. I haven't been able so much as to set foot in the country. Afterwards, I could call them every few weeks and talk to them on the phone. Over the years, I tried to convince myself that it was just an urban legend, that everything that happened was just some elaborate prank. But sometimes, I'm not so sure. My grandfather died two years ago. When he was sick, he wouldn't allow me to visit him, and he left strict instructions in his will that I wasn't to attend his funeral. It was all very sad. My grandmother called a few days ago. My grandmother called a few days ago. She said that she had been diagnosed with cancer. She missed me terribly and wanted to see me one last time before she died. Are you sure, Grandma? I asked. Is it safe? It's been ten years, she said. All that happened a long time ago. It's all forgotten. You're all grown up now. I'm sure there won't be a problem. But, but what about Hachisakutsama? I asked. For a moment, there was silence on the other end of the phone. Then I heard a deep, masculine voice saying, Oh, 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 oh.